Good morning. Chapter 7. Language in the Time Domain. Scenario 10. John Martin glared at his wife, his eyebrows knotted and his jaw grimly set. He had been down this road before, and he was very tired of it. What do you mean you don't have enough time, he demanded. You have just as much time as anybody else does. I don't know how you can say that. You know perfectly well that I work at least 70 hours a week. There is no way I can go to Jamie's play, and you know it. Well, what do you think I do? Lie around the pool all day? I spend just as many hours working as you do, and there are plenty of weeks when I spend more. That sounds logical, John, Elaine Martin said doggedly, but it's not the same. It's not the same at all. You have a choice. I don't. Wrong, John declared. It's exactly the same. You have to work to do. I have to work to do. And one of us has to postpone some of that work long enough to go with Jamie next Friday night. I went last year. It's your turn. And if you really cared about either Jamie or me, I wouldn't have to point that out to you. My work is just as important as yours, Elaine, and just as hard to put off. Why can't you see that? Why can't you ever consider the facts instead of your ridiculous fantasies? Elaine started to stare at him, outraged. Listen, she said, if you decide to take the day off or go home early, nobody gives you any static. But if I want to do that, I'm helpless because people will die if I'm not there. You can't tell me that's not different. John stood there silent for a minute, staring at her. And then he stepped back and made an elaborate, deep bow, his arms sweeping before him like a medieval courtier with a plumed hat in hand. As he straightened up, he spoke to her, the smile on his face as false as the absurd gesture had been. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten how you see the world, Elaine. You are the M deity. Without those radiant, whose radiant presence the ordinary person couldn't survive, that picture had slipped my mind in spite of the way you harp on it day and night. Pardon me, Dr. Martin. She turned her back on him, shaking, determined that he would not see her cry, and she answered him in icy tones. You don't understand, she said. It's not possible for someone who is not a doctor to understand. A doctor's time is not his own. Doctors have responsibilities they cannot set aside. Patients cannot wait. Advertising campaigns can. Elaine didn't jump when the door slammed. She had been expecting it. Now she could cry. In the past 20 years, much has been written about the way that perceptions of time vary from one culture to another. In the Dance of Life by Edward T. Hall, Rights of France, we're acquiring a customer means acquiring several generations of a family and is expected to take years of effort. He tells us about Brazil, where how long you have been in a line or on a list is irrelevant because only people who have no connections and don't know how to get along with others ever have to wait on lines or lists. He describes the Pueblo Indian culture in which no project can begin until all the right thoughts are present, which would be an impossible impediment to scheduling since no method exists for determining how long that will take. But such differences are not confined to different nations and ethnic groups, as scenario 10 shows. Two people who share the same cultural background can still be situated perceptually on opposite sides of a reality gap 
that has to do with time. This often leads to vicious arguments in language that is hard to forget, even if it is forgiven. Our scenario shows a time fiasco taking place between spouses, but the same altercation could have taken place in any professional or business context. The only difference between the two is that wounds are likely to be deeper when the person you're fighting with knows you well, because people who know you well know far more about where you are vulnerable. Few people, if you ask them to complete a reality statement, begin with, time is, would do so with ease. Even fewer would provide you with anything like Einstein's clear and emotionally neutral. Time is what the clock says, but you do need this information because a significant portion of your ability to predict another's behavior must be based on how they would complete that statement and how their statement might differ from your own. One way to investigate perceptions of time is by finding out what role time fills in someone's image of reality, considering the following simple sentence. John hit the golf ball with the club. In this sentence, John fills the role of doer. He does the action described. The golf ball's role is the object. What the action is done to and the club fills the role of instrument, what John does the action with. The language you speak determines the assignment of these roles. And if your language allows you to assign something, this, say, object role, not to be confused with the schoolroom term, direct object, it encourages you to perceive that thing as something over which you have power. In English, we say Harry rode a horse, and because the horse is the object, we perceive Harry as doing something to the horse. In Navajo, the horse's role is not object, but associate, so that the equivalent sentence means Harry and the horse went about together. In Hopi, the horse's role is instrument. Harry uses the horse to go about with, just as he would use a fork to eat with. And in French, the horse has roughly the role of place. It's just where Harry happens to be located as he rides. Such linguistic phenomena have powerful effects on the way we think and the way we believe. English has a revealing metaphor, originally Benjamin Franklin's. Time is money. For much of the American population, this metaphor dominates their image of reality, and they assign time the object role accordingly. They do things to time. They spend it, save it, waste it, give others a few hours of it, and resent the squandering of precious moments of it. For them, everyone has a personal inventory of units of time, just as they have a personal inventory of units of money, and this inventory is something under their control to be managed in the same way a stock portfolio is managed. John Martin's language in Scenario 10 fits this metaphor. He says things like, have enough time, have just as much time as anybody else, spend just as many hours working. But Elaine Martin's language makes it clear that she does not perceive time as something she controls. On the contrary, she uses the very strange sentence, a doctor's time is not his own, which contradicts itself. She complains of her helplessness in terms of time, and she becomes so upset and so afraid of showing her emotions that she turns her back on her husband and switches to computer mode. Changing the situation is the proper business of a novel. It won't be attempted here. But there are useful things to be learned from examining and rewriting scenario 10. Obviously, if your dominant reality statement is time is money and you are forever fighting with someone about time, you should investigate the possibility that your opponent 
doesn't subscribe to that metaphor if time, as he or she perceives it, fills the role of doer rather than object, if time passes and drags and flies and runs out and goes by, and it is the image set that is dominant. The two of you are involved in one of those it's only semantics situations. You are not speaking the same language. You are not syntonic. And meaningful communication between you will demand careful, syntonic, oh, careful attention to that problem. Knowing this, like knowing that someone perceives failure as plus final, will help you understand behavior that would otherwise be mysterious and perhaps infuriating. Another possibility is that the individual does share your metaphor, but believes himself or herself to be a failure at the task of managing time. Again, careful attention will be needed if the two of you are to communicate successfully. Time out for a brief review and a new technique. Other things are going on in the scenario 10 and you will have begun to be aware of them in the systematic fashion instead of at the level of gut feeling. It's worth stopping for a moment to review the characteristics of language behavior that you will have noticed as you were reading the scenario. For example, satire modes analysis. John Martin stays in blamer mode throughout the entire scenario. Elaine Martin begins by blaming back, which results in a predictable escalation of the fight, but becomes alarmed and switches to computer mode before it's over. Sensory modes analysis. John Martin shows a strong preference for sight mode, while Elaine Martin repeatedly uses hearing mode vocabulary. Verbal attacks analysis. John and Elaine not only use the verbal attack patterns of English in addition, the multiple heavy stresses in their sentences signal almost incessant verbal attacks even when the pattern don't, patterns don't appear. Matters would improve if one of these two people would match the other's preferred sensory mode or refrain altogether from sensory vocabulary. Matters would improve if they would stop feeding one another's blaming loops. Matters would improve if they would moderate their intonation to get rid of the sarcasm and hostility it conveys. Those improvements might well keep John Martin from losing his temper, as we have already seen him do at the office, and throwing both undignified body language and deliberate vicious words into a pot already boiling over. And they might make it possible for Elaine Martin to explain her feelings more completely, competently. Rewriting the scenario to reflect these changes would be a good exercise. But before you start writing, I want to tell you about another technique that would be helpful to John and Elaine Martin. They need a better way to express their complaints. Let's begin by considering their perceptions of what they have to complain about, and then go on to the technique. I'm gonna stop here and continue on the next one. We are in chapter seven from the book, Success with the Gentle Art of Verbal Self-Defense by Suzette Hayden Elgin. I thank you for listening. I appreciate you.